What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda and Danny Abdeljabar. What's up, brother? How are you? Chilling, man. As per usual, how are you doing? It's uh going going pretty well. How are you? What have you been doing? Um, you know, not really a whole lot uh, since we last spoke in. Um, oh, uh, actually, earlier today, I turned on the uh, Friends uh, reunion documentary. Have you ever, you, you a fan of uh, Friends? You ever watch Friends? No. Okay. Why don't we just talk about Israel Palestine <laughs> like we were last week? <laughs> All right, I guess so. <laughs> um, right now, we are recording at. 10 30 or 10 40 p.m on thursday um to what 28th so this episode will be released on sunday uh, but yeah we did an episode last week on uh, on the origins of the um you know the, the conflict that's going on in, in palestine uh hey palestine doesn't exist we did these and are doing these episodes uh with the expectation that People are going to be a little upset with the things that we say. Some people will be. Some people. Well, actually, I think everybody ends up getting upset for some reason, Uh, either because we're not giving a narrative or because we're not giving enough of a narrative. You know, we're too soft on one or the other side, or we're too hard on one or the other side. There's no pleasing you guys, but I will say that you guys ate this episode up because it it definitely uh, was among. Or probably arguably one of the one of the heavier downloads in the first week uh, of our of our show really uh, so clearly you guys were hungry for this content and you know we decided to keep it going and what's interesting is that I mean it's not interesting this is a this is a topic that it's kind of taboo you know what I mean it's a bit. it's been taboo for for my lifetime it's it's considered the third rail of politics talking about Israel um, so I think that there is less of a stigma than there has been ever but yeah um, last episode we received a the messages from people who listen to the show uh, people who are first-time listeners and you know, um, most of the messages were not, they weren't messaging us because they liked our take. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> so um, here's an email that I received from someone who watches, who listens to the show and who I, you know, who's been listening to us for a while. So I appreciate the message, but I'm going to read it out and then we can kind of build up from here. Um, Hi, Henry, Danny, your last podcast on Israel, Palestine compelled me to reach out to you. For the most part, I find you guys pretty even-handed when it comes to foreign policy issues, and that's one of the reasons why I'm a fan of the show. However, your last episode was overwhelmingly biased against Israel. First and foremost, I find it funny that you call the Syrian lunatic head choppers uh, while refraining from criticizing Hamas. Hamas shares the same worldview of many of the extremist Islamic groups fighting in the war in Syria. Also, Why is Israel the bad guy, but a brutal dictator who drops barrel bombs on his own cities, killing thousands of innocent people? Spare your condemnation. I think he's talking about Assad there. (laughs) He's talking about Assad, who is the democratically elected president of Syria. Didn't you see the vote? He won 95% of his vote. Right. So That's how much his people love him. Totally legit, I'm sure. 95. But he's still not as popular as his father, who was winning like 99 or hundred percent, one hundred and three percent, hundred and four percent, still, yeah. still living in his father's shadow. Yeah. Um, I know Israel is not perfect and has done a lot of bad things. However, I think you fail to see that the reason for uh, their current policies are for their own security. I get this argument, man. I used to make the same argument when it came to Israel and Palestine. I I get a lot of the arguments on the on the israeli side of like you know we you know these people you know we try to make peace with them they just don't want peace they want to eliminate jews these people are crazy these are uh islamo fascist we're not i'm not going to sit here and lie or we're not going to sit here and lie to you and say hamas is um in the words of tim Dillon, is a theater group <laughs> No, they're a violent group that has engaged in terrorist activities, and we're happy to point those activities out or, you know, some of the past 
do you want to do yeah, that? Like, do you want to yeah, go over d- some of definitely. that? Definitely. And, and I think, you know, after reading this and also just seeing some of the responses that we got, you know, uh, maybe we weren't clear enough uh, that Hamas is bad, right? Uh, and and I, I thought I thought we were pretty clear about that. But, you know, when I think it did, goes without saying that we don't, be, you know, believe it, in like bus bombings and suicide bombings. <laughs> yeah. If you I listen mean, it, to this it's, show. It's, it's, it's kind However, of a shame if we have to like people, restate that. But, Some people are binary the way they think, right. and you know, you you are either you are either against Hamas or you're or right. with and, Hamas. And I think the trouble is with the, the trouble with the last episode was honestly just that that we were bringing up factual and relevant you know uh, lines of argumentation about not necessarily in support of actions that Hamas has done or other terrorist groups in uh, uh, among the Palestinians, but. Um, for context of them, right? And I think that's that's what we were aiming to do, and we wanted to show that you know it's it's not so cut and dry as you're led to believe. And so I, I want to take this opportunity to just may, maybe work in a bit more uh, on the one the the one perspective, which is that Hamas is a piece of shit terrorist organization. And I found uh, literally right on the uh, website of the Israeli um, Ministry for Foreign Affairs, and they pretty extensively list out pretty much every you know suicide bombing and terrorist attack that that has happened against their country. They they do a, a really good job um, with documenting that. And I just want to take some time and actually just read through some of these with this. Um, so let's start like around 2000, so June 2001. There was a suicide bombing uh, of a Tel Aviv discotheque that uh, killed 21 people and injured 120. Uh, About a month later, there was another one at a restaurant uh, which killed 15 people and 130 uh, were wounded. Uh, A couple months later in December of the same year, there was a double suicide bombing um, in a pedestrian mall, the the Ben Yehuda Street pedestrian mall uh, in Jerusalem. And 11 people were murdered there and 188 wounded. Um, there was another one uh, that same month, pretty much the next day, actually, December 2nd, uh, where a bus line had been bombed in Haifa. Uh, that was 15 people were murdered and 40 were wounded. Uh, you know, 2002, the next year uh, in March, uh, at a Jerusalem cafe, 11 people murdered, 54 were wounded. Uh, you know, skipping ahead quite a bit, and there's plenty more. Uh, there's a, another incident in June 2002 uh, where uh, another bus had been blown up, uh, and 19 people were murdered, 74 were wounded. I mean, I can go on and on and on about all of these. There, it's it's almost countless, and every life that is taken in every situation is absolutely abhorrent and what what you learn from reading about a lot of these these attacks is that for a bit in the early 2000s it kind of sucked to live in israel you know as an israeli you know what it became like a liability just to go out and live life like you know we all bitch about coronavirus these days you know about how you know you can go out and catch coronavirus and die or like spread it to someone else and they die. But like for Israelis in the early 2000s at this point, living in fear of Hamas was a very real thing. Like you, you couldn't take a bus. I mean, you could, but you'd risk being blown up and it was happening once a month, once every other month, all over the place. You couldn't go to a cafe or an open restaurant because either it would get bombed or rocket striked. You know, you couldn't just shop. There was there was a there was a ton of a, of these where it was just like somebody standing outside of their door at home, and they just get hit with a rocket. You know, so if we weren't clear enough, it it really really sucked to be an Israeli citizen during this time, and it was scary. And a lot of people were dying, and, and reasonably so. A lot of people were getting very angry at this. And it, and it, you know, for 
you know, along this narrative, like when, when you're growing up in this situation, when you're living in there and either people, you know, are dying or your family is dying or your neighbors are dying or even just areas that you frequent are being blown up. Like you don't care that the Palestinians were going through some shit too. And that moment, all you, all that matters is that your life is in danger and the lives of the people that you care about are in danger. And honestly, it's, it's pretty fucked up because a lot of these victims, then, you know, the, 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 the people who perpetrated these attacks, Hamas and, and other uh, terrorist groups among Palestinians would kind of rub it in and, and, and call the murders heroic. You know, I, I was, I was reading, um, that there were in total, uh, victims of Palestinian violence and terrorism since t- September 2000. There have been 1,362 people killed and God knows how many more wounded um, by Palestinian violence and terrorism. And and they go on and on and on. This is like 66 pages worth of of, <laughs> of this shit. And it um, the last time uh, that they talk about specifically a Hamas attack was October 1st, 2015. And that was um, Rabbi uh, Item Henkin. And this is actually in this list, they, they go through a lot of the people uh, and their names and things like that, which really solidified his news, not just like, um, you know, random statistics. So him and his wife, uh, Nama, they're 30 and 31 years old. They had six children. They were killed in a drive-by shooting attack. Um, and this was in Samaria uh, on, a, on like 9 p.m. on a Thursday night. And they were shot multiple times and they were pretty much dead at the scene Four of their kids were with them. Um, and f- they were aged between four months and nine years old. And they were all treated for obviously shock. None of them died, thankfully. Um, but then a Hamas spokesperson who took, you know, um, uh, who, who took, uh, uh, responsibility for the attack. They, they called it brave resistance. And they, they also said it was heroic. And frankly, there is nothing heroic about gunning down a family on a street in a drive-by like ever and you know it it doesn't stop at october you know 2015 i mean it keeps going notably and very interestingly um they this particular website that's that's done by the the um the israeli foreign ministry stops labeling the perpetrators as specifically hamas um or fatah or plo or etc or islamic jihad and they start labeling it as just straight up Palestinian terrorism, terrorist, or they fail to say who was the perpetrator, which personally I find a little bit odd. Um, but I think there is this extreme period of violence, especially in the early 2000s, and then a real big buildup around 2014 during Operation Protective Edge. And then from there, we actually start seeing a decline in this, you know, in, in this extremist actions. Uh, and this is all noted by the Israeli uh, um, foreign ministry on this website. You know, things like rocket attacks start going down. Um, the the frequency of these attacks in general on this like extensive list that they have go down. Um, something interesting is uh, there was no listed terrorist acts from December 2020 to May 2021. Um which just eyeballing it myself looked like one of the longer periods of calm throughout the entire list. Cause it, it seemed like once a month or once every other month, there was at least one terrorist activity. And also they have a graph up where they show the rocket attack frequency, which for the period of March, 2020 through November, 2020 was effectively zero. Obviously coronavirus must've definitely put a hamper on that. Um, but but generally speaking, as far as uh, random attacks and rocket attacks, we've actually been seeing a period of calm of 18 months or so, which is why I think this particular um, flare-up of this conflict is so striking because it, w- it actually felt like it was getting better. It, sound- it felt like it was getting quieter. And then suddenly it, it exploded into what we, what we went through in detail over the last couple of weeks. I think it's worth going through the history of Hamas. Um, in short, Hamas is kind of like Israel's version of the Taliban. 
So they're a Salafist Sunni group. Uh, they're resisting occupation. Uh, they engage in, in violent terrorist activity, such as suicide bombing. And like the Taliban, it's a Frankenstein monster that was that was inadvertently created to be a bulwark against secular enemies or a secular threat. You know, in the case of the Mujahideen, that that was the atheist Soviet Union. And in the case of Hamas, that was the secular Arab nationalist groups, like such as the PLO. Hmm. And this isn't like some crackpot theory. You know, this is a narrative that you're going to find in the Wall Street Journal. You're going to find it in the Washington Post. You're going to find it in the in the Times of Israel. You know, the first time I ever heard this, you know, and it really kind of blew my mind. It was actually Ron Paul. Ron Paul was talking yep. about this in Congress, mm -hmm. and he was saying like, you know, it was you know Israel actually. Uh, pretty much helped create Hamas. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. I never heard that. And then I yep. said, okay, I looked it up and I was like, oh, wow, he's, everything he said was correct. In many ways, what's happening in the Middle East, and in particular with Gaza right now, we have some moral responsibility for both sides uh, in, in a way because we provide help and funding uh, for both Arab nations and Israel. And uh, so we definitely have a moral responsibility, and especially now today, the weapons being used to uh, kill so many Palestinians are American weapons, and uh, American funds essentially are being used uh, for this. But there's a political liability, which I think is something that we fail to look at because too often there's so much blowback from our intervention in areas that we shouldn't be involved in. You know, Hamas, if you look at the history, you'll find out that Hamas was encouraged and really started by Israel because they wanted Hamas to counteract Yasser Arafat. And you say, well, yeah, that was better then and it served its purpose, but we didn't want Hamas to do this. So then we as Americans say, well, we have such a good system, we're going to impose this on the world. We're going to invade Iraq and teach people how to be Democrats. We want free elections. So we encourage the Palestinians to have a free election. They do, and they elect Hamas. So we first indirectly and directly through Israel help establish Hamas. Then we have election. Then Hamas becomes dominant, so we have to kill them. You know, it, it just doesn't make sense. During, during the 80s, uh, you know, we were allied with Osama bin Laden. And uh, we were con contending with the Soviets. It was at that time our CAA thought it was good if we radicalized the Muslim world. So we financed the madrasa schools to radicalize the Muslims in order to compete with the, with the Soviets. There's too much blowback. There's a lot of reasons why we should oppose this resolution. It is not in the interest of the United States. It's not in the interest of Israel either. And um, I grabbed a quote from the Times of Israel, and this was written a couple of years ago. And just to kind of prove what I'm saying is not this is not some uh, thing to uh, be allergic to or some conspiracy theory. During the early 1970s, the greatest enemy to Israel was known as the Palestinian Liberation Organization, who was known for waging terror attacks on Israeli civilians and targets all over the world. The PLO was known for being a socialist organization whose sole purpose was the elimination of the state of Israel along with the establishment of a socialist state of Palestine where the constitution would run by secular Marxism rather than Islam. There was an idea to bring about a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood into Gaza and the Palestinian territories to counterbalance the strength and popularity of the PLO. Yeah. Now, Hamas is an outgrowth of the Muslim Brotherhood. So the Muslim Brotherhood is, is they're a transnational Islamic group that was founded in 1928 by Hassan al-Banna. And in the in 1930s... Egypt. In Egypt specifically, right? In Egypt. And mm -hmm. in the 1930s and 1940s, the Brotherhood had established branches all across the Middle East. So they had branches in Syria, they had branches in Jordan, they had branches in Palestine... The Jerusalem and the Jordanian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood was founded by the son-in-law of, of uh, Hassan al-Banya. Um, his name was Saeed Ramadan. And these movements 
they were supported by both the the Hashemites of Jordan and also the the Muhammad Ali dynasty of Egypt. Right. And and you know, I think it's important to kind of point out a little bit about, you know, Hassan and the Muslim Brotherhood because, you know, uh, Hassan al-Banna, the guy who made the Muslim Brotherhood was an, he was an imam and, you know, he really thought that the Arab society was lacking in a lot of different places, namely specifically social services. Remember, um, it, it, we're talking about 1928 Egypt here, right? Uh, so it's not a surprise that they were lacking social services. So things like charities, education, stuff like that. Um, and he honestly really didn't like the secularization of, of, um, of the Arab world, specifically Egypt, but definitely the Arab world by European imperialism. Again, we're, we're talking about a period where you know, things are being divided up by European powers and, you know, they're kind of imposing a westernized or definitely a secularized ideal, um, you know, to, to build these countries, these new countries that are springing up. And, you know, he, he was opposed to it. You know, he thought that it was against, you know, uh, what was best for the, you know, Arab world. And so that's why he started the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, and the first thing that they started doing was setting up a lot of these social services in Egypt, and and it was super super popular, uh, which is why it ended up spreading to all those other countries that that um, Henry had mentioned. Um, but the main goal of the Islamic Brotherhood was always to stop secularization and set up basically Islamic fundamentalism in the Arab world. And you know, again, remember they were creating a lot of these social services, including schools, and they used those schools to spread this message. So it was kind of like a you know, um, like a feedback loop almost, you know, they were creating the centers that were educating the people and the way that they were educating them was underneath with, with these ideals in mind. And so, you know, in the forties, they started turning to violence because prior to this, they had been pretty, pretty quiet, pretty, you know, we're talking about from 28 to 40. So it's like 12 years or so that they weren't blowing shit up and they were just mostly making schools and shit. And a lot, they were supported by governments and by entities all over the world and then in the 40s this just goes to shit they start bombing uh and bombing buildings assassinating like political enemies and shit like that because they they started feeling like they were gaining enough traction as a as a multi multinational group that they wanted to start grabbing more political power and i guess this is the way that you know m many of them decided was the way to go uh obviously <laughs> No, nobody likes suicide bombings or political assassinations. Uh, so it didn't go very well in the countries that they were set up in, especially in Egypt. So a lot of these countries started cracking down on them, you know, uh, in this period. So by 54, uh, the Brotherhood actually attempted to assassinate the Egyptian president, um, Gamal Abdel Nasser. And as a result, uh, the government arrested thousands of people uh, who were members of the Brotherhood or at least suspected of being um, part of the Brotherhood. And for a bit, it kind of died down, right? Um, it was real quiet. But by 1970, the new Egyptian president, um, and this is Anwar Sadat now, he ended up releasing a bunch of the, the leaders from, uh, the Brotherhood's leaders from prison. And, and those folks went on to rebuild the organization. But in this time, they kind of promised that they weren't going to do any of the violent bits, uh, but they wanted to just focus on setting up fundamentalist Islamic yeah, he brought up he, he released them because he needed a political base when it once after Nasser uh, was out of power. That's right. Um, but yeah, sorry, go on. No, no worries. Um, I, I think at the, by this point, so we're we're talking like post nineteen seventy, they're all out. They're basically rebranding themselves as like peaceful again, um, but they're definitely still interested in setting up a fundamentalist, you know, Islamic Arab world, and they start picking up steam again. And again, they start picking up steam because of their focus on creating social services. So schools, uh, mosques, um, uh, uh, charities, banks, uh, they, give it, they give out a shit ton of loans for businesses. Um, and, and at the same time, we start seeing actually across the entire Arab world a shift from like the imperialist secularism to theism like back to islam and i'm not sure there's a bit of a chicken and the egg this part i'm not super certain about i don't know if it it was because of efforts from groups like the um muslim brotherhood that started getting people more into you know uh, uh islam as a guiding principle for governance or 
if it was because people were feeling that way already that groups like the Muslim Brotherhood started picking up steam again. I'm not sure which one came first. Um, but what we can say is that they both happened around the same time. Right. And so people are starting to become more fundamentalist. And actually, if we really think about it, around the same time is when we start seeing evangelical Christianity or fundamentalist Christianity spring up in the U.S. So this is kind of something that people are, like theism is making a comeback in general, like all over the world. Um, so this interesting thing to, to mull over. I'm not sure if they're related or not, but um, just something to think about. Um, anyway, so the, the they start picking up steam, and by the 80s, uh, the Brotherhood had already been operating in Gaza and in the West Bank, uh, where, like I said, they had been setting up a bunch of social services like mosques and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, by 1987, there's this guy who's super important that we'll want to remember. His name is Sheikh Ahmed Yassin. And he brought together all of the folks uh, from the Muslim Brotherhood in Gaza under a new umbrella, and they called that umbrella Hamas. And so we're kind of like back to the beginning, right? So where did Hamas come from? It's an offshoot of, of the Muslim Brotherhood. And Hamas's goal at the time was to set up a Palestinian state, but one that was specifically Islamic and not secular. And that was their stated goal at the time. And actually... You know, I think you kind of pointed this out, Henry, in the beginning and contrasting against, you know, uh, uh, other groups like the PLO or more specifically Fatah, which hopefully we can talk about in a minute. Um, Hamas started off pretty peaceful. They avoided terrorism. Um, they were mostly just, you know, pulling from the uh, Muslim Brotherhood playbook of setting up social services and making, you know, education and health services. I think this is kind of where we're coming to the the honestly not so crazy argument that the Israeli government kind of liked Hamas, right? When you think about it, uh, the other folks like Fatah and the PLO were more of a threat to them than Hamas was. We've got these fundamentalist Arabs who, you know, probably don't like Jews very much, but at the very least, they're not blowing anything up and they're pretty popular. And these other guys, the the PLO, the, the Fatah, you know, they're blowing shit up. They're doing terrorism and, and also are pretty popular among the, the Palestinians too. And you know, if you had to choose one of the two evils, you're probably going to go with the, the folks that aren't blowing anything up. And so, you know, they, they thought that supporting them would, or at least looking, you know, turning a blind eye to them would help weaken Fatah, who was really the, you know, the threat to Israel and, and, and also kind of the, the, the standoff against um, uh, Hamas. But, you know, in that same, by that time, in December 87, you know, we had the first intifada and things started turning around, but I think I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So let's just pull this back a little bit because that was a lot. Um, so <laughs> sorry, <laughs> political. So political Islam became a bulwark against Arab nationalism. And, um, you know, this is the, the Arab cold war. I don't know if anyone's heard this term before, but it was a book. It was coined by, um, Malcolm Kerr, um, Steve Kerr's father, he's a coach of the Warriors, mm -hmm. um, who was assassinated, allegedly, by Hezbollah. Um, I didn't know that. You know, That's interesting. You know what's interesting is that Steve Kerr, when it, right after his father was assassinated, he played for Arizona. and um, The Suns? No, he, no, he played, Steve Kerr, when he was at, I forget if, if he played for Arizona State or if he played for Arizona. Uh, I think I think he was Arizona State, and he pl and he was playing a game at Arizona. Mm -hmm. Might be getting this backwards. Um, but when this happened, a bunch of fans of uh, Arizona fans were taunting him, yelling P L O P L O. That's, that's fucked up. And then he and he was like, I don't know why they were yelling P L O. We actually like those guys. They served as bodyguards for us when we were in Beirut. Oh shit! <laughs> so he's like, I don't know what, but they were doing it with the intent to, you know, be me <laughs> disrespectful yeah, to be a dick yeah uh, mm -hmm. but we still like we, we see this today so secular leader leaders will clash with islamic organizations in the middle east um for example in the 80s uh hafez al Saad he killed thousands and thousands of muslim brotherhood and so hamas as it grew out of the muslim brotherhood it found itself in the fight against uh, arab nationalism now I think it's important to note that not only did the Muslim Brotherhood give birth to Hamas, but also Fatah yep. was part of that movement, at least at first. 
Mm -hmm. Fatha came from the League of Palestinian Students, but guys like um, Arafat and Salah Khalaf um, splintered off in the 1950s. And when they started fighting is the the Israelis in, in guerrilla warfare, the you know the Muslim Brotherhood would oppose them. In right. fact, you know it was the Muslim Brotherhood who, like you mentioned earlier, you know they not only tried to assassinate Gamal Nasser once, but they tried to assassinate him twice. And the mm -hmm. second time, by the second time they tried to assassinate him, um, you know, he was actively supporting the PLO. But um, it's interesting that you, you know, you bring up the story of, of uh, Sheikh Yassin and, and, um, and the, you know, the story goes like this. In, in 1965, the Egyptians arrest a man named Sheikh Yassin. And, uh, well, Sheikh is more of a title, but Sheikh is sent as the founder of Hamas, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. You know, he was he was killed in 2004, so right. going by Israel. Almost right. By uh, 16 years ago at this point. Yeah. But going back, um, so after the Six Day War, when Israel occupied Gaza and Sinai um, and the West Bank, the Israelis released Sheikh Yassin. So. They allowed Islamist groups in Gaza and the West Bank to be financed by groups in Saudi Arabia. And um, during these years, Hamas was an enemy of the PLO. So, for example, um, in the early 70s, when, you know, in Jordan, um, Jordan in the 70s, like 1970, 1971, they basically had a war, a civil war of like Palestinian refugees. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Hamas took the side of of, uh, of King Hussein, and um, you know, basically Jordan was trying to like reclaim, kick out the PLO out of out of Jordan, and, and Hamas took the side of of uh, the, the Hashemites. And there's this really interesting. You now, as mentioned, this has been written about for a long for for a long time. There was this um, article that came out in the Wall Street Journal, and it's from Andrew Higgins. It's from 2009. It's titled how Israel helped help to spawn Hamas. And um, to give you context of when it was written, it was written right after Operation Cast Lead, which was a very, very brutal and a very, very aggressive Israeli strike on Gaza that was, um, for all intents and purposes, uh, meant to kind of shake people because they had just lost the war in Lebanon. And um, I'm going to pull this up because I think it's an interesting article because it goes over the history better than I could explain it. When Israel first encountered Islamists in Gaza in the 1970s and 80s, they seemed focused on studying the Quran, not on confrontation with Israel. The Israeli government officially recognized a precursor to Hamas called Mujama. Ah Islamia, registering registering the group as a charity. Um, it allowed Mujama members to set up Islamic university and build mosques, clubs, and schools. Crucially, um, Israel often stood aside when the Islamists and their secular left-wing Palestinian rivals battled, sometimes violently. Also, I want to add to that point because uh, they also let them keep a stash of weapons, too, for exactly that point. So when, when the, the Islamists were fighting with the secular uh, uh, Palestinians, you know, Israelis were like kind of okay with what would, what is Hamas, what, what was Hamas then and still is Hamas today. They were like kind of looking, turn on a blind eye to the fact that they had a bunch of weapons because they were hoping that, that they would gun down the secular Palestinians that were more of a problem for them. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood, led in Gaza by Sheikh Yassin, was uh, free to spread its message openly. In addition to launching various charity projects, Sheikh Yassin collected money to reprint the writings of Saeed Kitib. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I never knew how to pronounce that. Saeed yeah, that's, Kitib. That's, that one's hard even for me. Could, um, an Egyptian copy. member of the Brotherhood who... Before his execution by President Nasser advocated global jihad, he is now seen as one of the founding ideologues of militant political Islam. Um, if you all ever read the book Looming Tower, um, Looming Tower is a book about the um, 
basically the lead up to 9-11 and, and Osama bin Laden and, you know, the formation of uh, Egyptian Islamic Jihad and the merger with the um, Afghan Arabs to eventually create, you know, Al Qaeda. And, you know, they didn't really go over, he doesn't really go over the plans for 9 11, but he goes over kind of like the how Al Qaeda started. It's a very good book. Right. First chapter is about Sayyid Kitip, and, and he kind of lays that as a foundation for, you know, the rest of the book that this guy was, um, he was a, he was, in the U.S. for a couple of years, and he became um, disenfranchised with Western values, and not like Western values now, like Western values in the 1940s when we're already conservative, you know, right, when right. a more conservative time. But you know, he became disenfranchised with Western values of things like consumerism, and I guess you know, you know, whatever uh, you know, he thought was too provocative in the culture, and he came back and. Yeah secularism and he came back to become a hardcore uh anti uh arab nationalist and you know yeah um i guess so it's, going it's back to what you what you just read the the point of what you just read was that the muslim brotherhood existed in gaza was allowed to exist in gaza by the israelis and they let them spread the teachings of a guy who basically inspired islamic jihad and eventually Al Qaeda, and definitely Hamas, <laughs> the militant part of Hamas. So the article goes on. So Mr. Cohen, who worked at the time for the Israeli government's religious affairs department in Gaza, says he began to hear disturbing reports in the mid 1970s about Sheikh Yassin from traditional Islamic clerics. He says they warned that the Sheikh had no formal Islamic training and was ultimately more interested in political. Than politics than faith. They said, keep away from Yassin. He's a big danger, recalls Mr. Cohen. You know, and that's something that I've actually heard a lot. A lot of these Islamist leaders, a lot of them don't know the Quran very well or don't know. I don't, I mean, obviously, I don't know the Quran at all, so I couldn't really tell you or judge the, or be the benchmark, but I've read that. That a lot, like of, a, a lot of them have Freedom more political. Have but, sorry. Oh, what were you saying? What was your uh, analogy? I was just going to say like how U.S. freedom fighters or whatever, you know, folks on either side of the aisle will not actually read the Constitution. You should have a Constitution in your pocket. No. That, that's I'm what... joking. <laughs> um, I know someone who has a Constitution in their pocket. That's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> I have my miniature Constitution, and I'm going to read it. Okay. Instead, um, Israel's military-led administration in Gaza looked favorably on the parap paraplegic cleric who set up a wide network of schools, clinics, a library, and kindergartens. Sheikh Yassin formed the Islamist group Mujama al-Islamiya, which was officially recognized by Israel as a charity, and then in 1979 as an association. Israel also endorsed the establishment of the Islamic University of Gaza, which is now which is now regards as a hotbed of militancy. Yeah, well, you know, that university gets blown up basically every couple of years. And they keep rebuilding it. Clashes between Islamists and secular nationalists spread to the West Bank and escalated during the early 1980s, convulsing college campus, campuses, particularly Berzit University, a center of political activism. As the fighting between rival student factions at Berzit grew more, more violent, uh, General Shalom Hariri, then a military intelligence officer in Gaza, says he received a call from Israeli soldiers manning a checkpoint on the road out of Gaza. They had stopped a bus carrying Islamic activists who wanted to join the battle against Fatah. Now that is really right, weird. So, 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 so a checkpoint guy in Gaza, Israeli checkpoint guy, calls his like uh, his commanding officer he's like yo I got a bus full of like Islamic fighters that say that they're off to go fight Fatah at Beirut Site University what do I do so so what is what does the general say I don't know I don't think that you I don't think that was ever addressed in this article um, well actually no excuse me it is addressed in this article I'm wrong I said if they want to burn each other let them go there you have it. <laughs> Calls, recalls Mr. Hariri. 
You know, that so, is, so he uh, basically says, just go for it. Let them kill each other. Yeah. If they're, if these two groups of Muslims want to kill each other, why not let them do it? Like, go for that's it. The, that's the mentality. Um, yeah. Which is kind of funny. Because um, a, a lot of, like, neoconservative types, I've heard this out of so many people's mouths uh, when talking about this issue. And also I've read about it, and there's been millions of papers on it, so you know where it's all coming from. <laughs> right, right. Um, but <laughs> they're like... Hey man, like the Muslims, you know, they can't really live in the same country together. Like they're just kind of like, they hate each other. They hold on to the kind of primitive values and they want to just kill each other all the time. So we need to kind of pit them against each other. <laughs> like we just need to pit the Sunnis in, usually it's in the context of Sunnis and Shias. Right. We need to pit the Sunnis and the Shias against each other. If they hate each other already, look like, why not? And I'll, and I'll be like, oh, that's uh weird and creepy that you you know think like that it's like let's facilitate the fight between these let's, two like you know groups and eventually um, they'll get their own state but yeah um all right a year later in 1984 the israeli military received a tip off from fatah supporters that sheik yasin's gaza islamists were collecting arms according to israeli officials in gaza at the time Israeli troops raided a mosque and found a cache of weapons. Sheikh Yassin was jailed. He told Israeli interrogators the weapons were for use against rival Palestinians, not Israel. According to Mr. Hakam, the military affairs expert who says he spoke frequently with jailed Islamists, the cleric was released after a year and continued to span Mujama's reach across Gaza. And just to recap, you know, what this article is saying, also for my own recap, so I don't lose myself. Uh, so in a conscious effort to undermine the PLO, in 1978, the government of, of, of uh, then Prime Minister uh, Menahem Begin approved the application of Sheikh Ahmad Yassin to start a humanitarian organization known as Mujama. And that was a seed that eventually grew into Hamas. Right. And throughout that time, throughout that growth period, there had been multiple instances where some red, fl- what would be, what should be, should have been characterized as red flags came up, right? Whether it's finding groups of Islamists that are like ready to go to war, or finding weapons caches, allowing you know uh, the the spreading of of you know uh, uh, fundamentalist Islamic jihad, you know. Uh, there's a there's a bunch of shit that was happening during this period that either I mean we look at now you know from a historical perspective maybe hindsight was 2020 it was really hard to see during the time but it really seems like there was a lot of like warning signs that this Hamas group was not necessarily great and nevertheless it seems like they were kind of okay with it or they were tacitly supporting it right um, or directly supporting it. I mean, or directly supporting they, they, it. They they uh, accepted them as a as a humanitarian organization. You know, like it's. We're talking about Hamas here, right? We're talking about the folks that, like, if today we started this, you know, this episode with me, undeniably revoking Hamas and 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 in great detail outlining several instances of 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 heinous atrocities committed by Hamas. And they just kind of were allowed to be a thing. Well, let's continue on to this article. In 1987, several Palestinians were killed in a traffic accident involving an Israeli driver, triggering a wave of protests that became known as the first Antifada. Mr. Yassin and six other Mujama Islamists launched Hamas, or the Islamic Resistance Movement. Hamas's charter, released a year later, is studded with anti-Semitic and declares jihad its path and death for the cause of Allah is most sublime, sublime belief. So, was interest. So, Hamas, and uh, just to give you kind of an idea of how it was formed, or at least when it was first formed, it was had three different parts of it. So, there was um, a political wing, which, like you know, did leaflets and raised money, mainly from Gulf states. Yeah, mostly headed up by Yasin himself in that particular wing also. It was recruited, so it recruited members, it co-opted mosques, um, it dealt with, like, you know, the Saudi princes who were giving money to it. Right. 
Um, the intelligence apparatus, which later then eventually merged into the uh, Al Qasim Brigade, which is the military wing. And um, the Israelis didn't interfere with their activities because it served the purpose of marginalizing the PLO, which even resulted in meetings between Hamas and the Israeli government officials. So, you know, there was open dialogue and open meetings with them even after Hamas and their charter, which was, you know, which was aggressive, um, was made. And they were still meeting with them. Um, and you can't give me that excuse like they didn't know, they didn't read the charter. Are you kidding me? Right. Oh, we didn't know. We didn't know that there were anti Semites. We didn't know they, that they we didn't know Israel. that they had it. Uh, but this, um, I guess this tacit cooperation ends with the kidnapping of uh, and, and murder of these two Israeli soldiers. Right. A lot of Hamas members were, were, were arrested. It was banned. And then um, Ahmed Yassin was arrested again. But let's go on to this article. Israeli officials still focused on Fatah and initially unaware of Hamas's charter. Can it continue? Oh, yeah. Initially unaware of Hamas's charter, continued to maintain contacts with Gaza's Islamists. Mr. Hakam, the military Arab affairs expert, remembers taking one of Hamas's founders, Mahmoud Zahir, to meet Israeli's then defense minister, Yitzhak Rabin, as part of a regular consultation between Israeli officials and Palestinians not linked to the PLO. Mr. Zahar, the only Hamas founder known to be alive today, is now the group's senior political leader in Gaza. In 1989, Hamas carried out its first attacks on Israel, abducting and killing two soldiers. Israel arrested Sheikh Yassin and sentenced him to life. It later rounded up more than 400 suspected Hamas activists, including Mr. Zahar, and deported them to southern Lebanon. There, they hooked up with Hezbollah, the Iran-backed A-team of anti-Israeli militancy. So Many this is the, actually where. Hold on, before you continue, this is actually uh, th- that's an important bit because this is where the we we hear a current argument, especially by Netanyahu today, about how Hamas is was created by Iran, right? That's the narrative. Iran is through through their proxies, Hezbollah, are funding and propping up and have effectively created Hamas. But that's like starting the story two chapters in, right? Um, sure, at this point, uh, you know, a lot of these Hamas activists uh, I, de- were deported to Lebanon, where they did uh, link up with Hezbollah, which is, you know, definitely linked to Iran without a doubt, right? They're proxy forces for sure. I don't think anyone doubts that, except for maybe um, uh, Iran themselves. They don't. <laughs> they don't admit it. Um, so yeah, that happened. And that's a thing, and that's probably the more current situation now, right? Where they're getting a lot of their funds and and stuff like that from. But but there's all of this history that happened beforehand, right? And I think starting the the creation of Hamas as this you know terror group that that just sprung up because of Hezbollah is just like. You know, it's sure we can start it that late. <laughs> you know, we can start the story that late if you want to ignore where they came from before that. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure how much Hezbollah has to do with funding or training Hamas. I know that's been the narrative for a while. Um, it's just the narrative, right? So I don't, I don't, I honestly have never really looked into the validity of that. I've always just. Uh, assumed that they could be doing it, but there's no proof of them doing it. That's I mean, always been my take. I've I've done a bit of reading on it, and the the most that I've been able to find is talking points. To be very honest, you know, like unfortunately, terrorists don't you know spread their receipts online for me to read. You know, but um, some sources which feel credible to me, you know, have have pointed out that the technology that you know, Hamas uses specifically today uh, in building their rockets um, are based on, you know, models from Iranian units, you know? So how else are they, how else are they getting their hands on this? I think we kind of had, we had a, uh, like a conversation about this when, you know, via Slack uh, on our Patreon Slack about, you know, like how the fuck are these people who, you know, for all intents and purposes, like their economy sucks and they're, you know, they're, what's allowed in and out is, is very limited, 
Like, how are they building rockets, especially rockets that can hit like hundreds of miles away at this point? Like, how are they doing that? Um, so if you ask me just by process of elimination or like, you know, educated guess, it is true that they did link up at this time in 89. You know, a lot of these activists were, uh, uh, Islamists, I should say, were sent, uh, deported to Lebanon where they did have contact with, uh, Hezbollah. And then today, now they have these rockets that are either the exact rockets that that Hezbollah uses and that Iran uses, or they're very close to the type of rockets there. So I don't actually doubt that Iran has a hand in in uh, Hamas, whether it's directly or indirectly through Hezbollah. I don't I don't think that's a question for me. Well, Ayatollah Khomeini, do you know that he was actually? Um, part of an unofficial branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, that makes sense. I didn't know that. So but that makes here's sense. something that's interesting about Ayatollah Khomeini. So when in 1953 um, coup against Mossadegh, Ayatollah Khomeini was a marcher hmm. against Mossadegh because Mossadegh was a was a, a like a nationalist. He wasn't that's like a, he wasn't a, a theocratic guy. Um, he wanted to national. The main reason why he was deposed is because he wanted to nationalize Iran's oil companies. Right. So, and the and the British had like re- had really very heavy interest. The British had already owned British petroleum. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a, a really large percentage, or they they had a lot of concession deals with um, with Iran in terms of uh, giving them favorable deals. Yep. So that's why we deposed them because the British asked us, but you know, th- th- that's the, you know, one of the narratives, but also the, I guess the, um, the Kermit Roosevelt, you know, who we spoke about yesterday a little bit, right? I think mm-hmm. we spoke about him yesterday. I don't, I forget. L- I don't episode, remember yeah. what, mm-hmm. I don't remember what's on the podcast and what's off <laughs> it sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we definitely he, talked about him. Yeah. He kind of spearheaded his own thing and, and you know did it after eisenhower called it off but the reasoning the justification that he gave was because he he said that they were going com- they were going communist and right. that's why they felt the need that they had to remove them uh so uh i mean that's that's the narrative but yeah it's interesting to uh, to learn that ayatollah Khomeini was actually the the mean old ayatollah was actually a anti Mossadegh marcher yeah so um yeah there's always been uh, I've always heard things about uh Iran it, it you know kind of having relations with the Muslim Brotherhood even though the Muslim Brotherhood is a Sunni organization like the reason why it's weird if you know if is um is because uh, the Sunni Shiite divide yeah. it's a Sun- the Sunni Shiite divide but I guess one of the things that we were trying to touch on in this show is that the original Arab Cold War was the secular Versus the versus nationals. the religious, mm-hmm. the, the nationalists versus the Islamists, yeah. polit- political Islam versus the uh, you know s- secular uh, nationalist Pan Arabism, and then the this over the past two decades kind of went reversed in history. Like now we have the religious wars, right? So we went from uh, not really being too much religious violence at all to being tons of religious violence over the past 20 years which is just very weird when you think about that like sure. how do we go backwards like religious warfare is something well, that happens I'll t- i mean I, could I you imagine t- the united states over the past 100 years going into re- like ever diving into religious warfare i mean it sounds so alien to us but when we when we talk about this particular you know um history it, it actually kind of makes sense to me you know because around the world you know, there was this kind of a lot of the pan Arabist movement, a lot of these national secular movements in the Arab world were leaning heavy Marxist. They were socialists, right? And so when you know the the, the Western reaction, and, and I'm including Israel in the rest in the in the West here, right? The Western reaction to you know um, to Marxism is just very gutturally like negative you know like they they will we the west has done whatever it can at every expense to make to to quell socialism to quell marxism all over the world 
Well, some would argue that the West is is socialism right now. Well, the, the we, we, we can we can have that <laughs> argument later. <laughs> Marxists are in the government. <laughs> <laughs> but my my point is, I mean, you you brought up several examples. I mean, the Mujahideen is a, is probably the shining example there, where we literally armed what became Al Qaeda, you know, uh, to fight the fucking Russians in Afghanistan, you know, and and what we see here, and we put them in Rocky, not Rocky. I, we put them in Rambo three, right. Exactly. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the, the, eventually, they became the Taliban, not Al Qaeda. But uh, you, you get what I'm saying. Um, and, and don't make the what's his name, <laughs> Tim Ryan. <mistake. laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to make Tulsi that mistake. Call you I, I promise, I know more about this than than he does. Um, so I, I know what you meant. And 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 for this in this case, right? If we're talking about like in the Israel Palestine lead up, we had the PLO, which were these Marxists, right? And we have the um, Hamas or the precursors of Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood bits, that were not <laughs> Marxist. So obviously, you know, they're gonna they're gonna side with the not Marxists on this, even if it seems like you know counterintuitive because because they're anti Semites or, or because they want to reclaim the entire land, the entire Levant for you know a new caliphate or something like that. You know, it just sounds fucking stupid. But like, it, what I urge people to to, to see here is is n- we're not I'm not trying to make the case that Israel created Hamas. No, that's that's not what I'm trying to say. What I am trying to say is that western governments in- they let it be created. Exactly. Western governments It was created under their supervision. Right. That's what you're trying o- to say. On their watch, right? On their watch, they let it happen. Right. Like, and they probably they wasn't intentionally in 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 many ways because they thought it was a better idea than letting a Marxist, secular, Palestinian movement be a thing. It's, it's just, that's the reality. And I think this is not, this shouldn't, this shouldn't come as a surprise and it shouldn't be like a, like a weird conspiracy theory or it shouldn't be viewed as like a weird conspiracy theory. Because if you can, if you can accept that for the story of the Mujahideen, then it's pretty easy to look, to like look at this situation and say, well, that's kind of the same. Different actors, con- but like kind of the same. Well, let's continue this article, and then I want to just finish this episode by saying some, reading some interesting uh, things that I've heard from an Israeli right wing leader. Okay. Um, but many of the deportees later returned to Gaza. Hamas built it up its arsenal and escalated its attacks, while all along maintaining the social network that underpinned its support in Gaza. So its social network and its uh, charitable and Honestly, it's Hamas's um, um, ability to be competent, honestly, at that time. Its organizational skills was the reason why they were ultimately elected. Right. It really had no reflection on the average Palestinian. I mean, maybe a little bit, but, like, the reflection really was based off, like, people saw the PLO as corrupt. Right. And, and they, they were. And they, went, and they, they were. gravitated towards, yeah, the PLO was. So they gravitated towards Hamas because they were, they were, again, they were, they were, they had the social networks, they had social programs. They, right. They were building mosques um, and schools and health centers, and they ran a tight ship, and they, they were characterized as having a clean government and not a corrupt government. I mean, you look at that as a, as a regular, like, human being and you're like well yeah fuck these other guys that are totally corrupt their their government is this government is terrible yeah i'm gonna vote for the guys who know how to build a school and like that helped my kids and they knew how to build a and they built a a health center that i can go to when i'm sick it makes sense it and it has nothing to do with the the religious component of it i would probably vote for i would vote for hamas now let that be taken out of context for <laughs> that, there's, a, in there's the a sound bite for you <laughs> i would vote for him i would vote for hamas would if have I voted for hamas in that, that time period yeah. in gaza um so meanwhile its enemy the plo dropped its commitment to israel's destruction and started negotiating a two-state settlement oh son of a bitch you're not supposed to negotiate for the settlement right you're supposed to be at war with us um hamas accused it of treachery that's that's when the light bulbs probably went off. Yeah. Like, oh, uh, yeah. This accusation found increasing resonance as, Israel's kept, as Israel kept developing settlements on occupied Palestinian land, particularly the West Bank. 
through the West Bank had passed to the nominal control of a Palestinian authority, it was still dotted with Israeli military checkpoints and a growing number of Israeli settlers. Unable to uproot a new entrenched Islamist network that had suddenly replaced the PLO as its main foe, Israel tried to decapitate it. It started targeting Hamas leaders. This too made no dent in Hamas's support, and sometimes even helped the group grow. In 1997, for example, Israel's Mossad spy agency tried to poison Hamas, Hamas's exiled political leader, Mr. Mr. Mashal, who was living in Jordan. So what does that sound like when you kill somebody or try to kill or somebody when you're tr- when you when you are trying to um, squash terrorism, but you just create more terrorism in the process? Like, you know, um, if you've seen the movie, if you've seen the movie War Machine, I feel like I did. Brad Pitt. That? Yeah. Yeah. I saw Brad it. Pitt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a scene in Brad in uh in War Machine, and uh, he's like Brad Pitt's character. That's he's one where they're rolling around uh, in the tanks and shit, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. he's playing. He's he's no, he's, that's not that's not it. That's Fury. Mm-hmm. Oh, my bad. That's a World War Two film. Continue. I'm Whatever. talking about. I, I think I'm talking I about a modern a movie about Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's called together. It's all Brad Pitt. It's late. It's it's late and very hot. This is usually the weird. The weird part of the podcast, right? The weird part of the podcast is when it gets late and hot. <laughs> um, but War Machine was based off um, Stanley McChrystal. It was based off uh, Michael Hastings' book about uh, McChrystal and uh, basically what was going on in Afghanistan. And it there's a scene where uh, Brad Pitt's character, who's playing a, a fictional version of Mc, uh, McChrystal, but it's like, I forget his name in the actual movie. It's similar sounding. Um, he's like, all right, you kill, uh, you know, you have four terrorists or insurgents and you kill two. How many do you have? And, and then someone's like, two. You have two. Right. Mm-hmm. And he's like, no, you have 16. <laughs> I'll tell you. It's like, because this person's brother joined. This, this guy's two brothers. You know, this guy's. So. You know, when you kill somebody, usually, you know, the blowback it's is a, that it's a family. Hi, it's a hydra effect, basically. You cut off one head, you get three more in its place. Yeah, totally. And and it's and why do you think there's more, there was way more Al-Qaeda after the Iraq war than before it? Because we bombed the shit out of all of them, and it pissed a yeah. lot of people off, and it made them sympathetic to their cause. And it also legitimizes them. You know, when you've got big, bad United States coming after, you know, what amounts to a small group of assholes in the Middle East, suddenly they're like, well, you know, what's up with these, this small group of assholes? <laughs> you know, they must be legit if they've captured the ire of the mighty United States. And same, same bit with the Moss, right? It's like you know, the Israeli Mossad is targeting their people. They must it's be called, important. <laughs> it's called blowback. Yep, blowback. Yeah. The agents got caught, and I'm going back to this Wall Street Journal article. The agents got caught, and to get them out of, Jord- of a Jordanian jail, Israel agreed to release Sheikh Yassin, the cleric of it, set off on a tour of Islamic of Islamic world to raise support and money. He returned to Gaza to a hero's welcome. So I don't understand why would they even release him from jail again. You know, I can only imagine, but maybe it's because they thought that keep him, keeping him in jail would rile people up more. Like people would be pissed and and you know start. Uh, they eventually kill the him streets. in two thousand four. Right, eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, I just why why it's like it sounds just strange. Um, Ephraim, Ephraim Halevi, a veteran Mossad officer who negotiated the deal that released Sheikh Yassin, says that the cleric's freedom was hard to swallow, but Israel had no choice. After the fiasco in Jordan, Mr. Havali was named director of Mossad, a position he held until 2002. Two years later, Sheikh Yassin was killed by an Israeli airstrike. Yep, we got to it. Mr. Halevi has in recent years urged Israel to negotiate with Hamas. He says that Hamas can be crushed... But he believes that the price of crushing Hamas is a price that Israel would prefer not to pay. Interesting. 
Um, when Israel's authoritarian secular neighbor Syria launched a campaign to wipe out the Muslim Brotherhood militants in the early 1980s, it killed more than 20,000 people, many of them civilians. Also in its recent war in Gaza, Israel didn't set the destruction of Hamas as its goal. It limited its stated objectives to halting the Islamist rocket fire and battering their overall military capacity. At the start of the Israeli operation in December, Defense Minister Ehud Barak told Parliament that the goal was to deal Hamas a severe blow, a blow that will cause it to stop its hostile actions from Gaza at Israeli citizens and, and, and soldiers. And that, and that exact uh, um, uh, goal is the same exact goal that we see in every major uh, offensive that Israel um, uh, wages against Gaza. It was that way in Protective Edge. Uh, what was the one in 2007? I forget the name of it. Cast Lead. Ca ca oh, sorry? Operation Cast Lead. Yeah. And and then again in Protective Edge. There was Edge. Pillar Defense in 2011, 2012, and then there was Cast Lead was the one before that. But right. Cast Lead was very, very destructive as well. Right. But in uh, Pillar of Defense was like not as destructive as the other ones but protect protective edge was the most destructive gaza one for sure and in every single one the 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 stated goal was always to do as as is quoted here by ehud barak the defense minister to deal hamas a severe blow a blow that will cause it to stop its hostile actions from gaza at israeli citizens and soldiers rock the shit out of them until they stop that's what it was well, it's not it's not working um so walking back to his house from the rubble of his neighbor's home, Mr. Cohen, the former religious affairs official in Gaza, curses Hamas and also what he sees as missteps that allowed Islamists to put down deep roots in Gaza. He recalls a 1970s meeting with traditional Islamic cleric who wanted Israel to stop cooperating with the Muslim Brotherhood followers of Sheikh Yassin. He told me, you're going to have big regrets in 20 or 30 years. He was right. That's the end of the article. Hmm. Now, I don't think that they overtly were like, oh, let's just create this organization called Hamas, and Hamas will um, basically serve to justify our settlement program that we have in the West Bank. No, certainly and not. I don't think that happened, but I think they certainly use them as that. Like, well, that's that's what they it is. That's where we're at today. Use Hamas as the primary justification to continue illegal settlements and settlements in the West Bank, um, or at least and, just occupation. Honestly, like, like set aside the the settlements themselves. I think that you know the threat of uh, of violence from Hamas gives the Israeli defense apparatus a pretty wide like long leash of what they can and can't do in the occupied territories in the occupied palestinian territories whether it's setting up defensive walls like they did whether it's islanding you know west bank with checkpoints whether it's completely blockading gaza and like restricting free motion these are all in this in the spirit of or in defense against radical Islamic terrorists like Hamas. And for for many years, it was always just Hamas, 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 Hamas. Yeah, but Hamas has just turned into a catch-all like. Well, actually, what defense I defense for anything that Israel does. Yeah, and, so and what's like, what's wild about it? I mentioned at the top of the uh, of the episode was that they stopped talking about specifically Hamas since 2015 till today, in all of the attacks, and they're just calling it now Palestinian terrorism, or terrorism, or not naming who the 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 culprits were. But we're just to you know we're we're supposed to draw the connection there. And this is directly from their government, right? Like there was 106 instances before 2015 uh, that they specifically said that Hamas took responsibility for it. And then they just kind of stopped talking about it from 2015 on. And there were plenty more well, that's because, from 2015 on. That's because Hamas was becoming more reasonable. It I seems mean, like a lot of these a lot of these attacks happen. A lot of the Israeli strikes happen when Hamas seems to be getting more reasonable, to be completely honest. 
Well, yeah, they have a violent history and they do violent things, but well, yeah, they're not suicide bombing people in Tel Aviv anymore. They're firing rockets with his no I with impunity. Condemn, basically. I don't agree with firing rockets and possibly killing civilians, but. I mean, what do you expect to happen when you're occupying somebody? Like, that's that's the, the blunt truth. Like, what do, you, what do you expect to happen when you treat people so bad? Like, what do you expect to happen when you are continuing to... So, it's kind of funny because, you know, this, this um, listener, and I appreciate the email. I don't want to, um, you know... I don't want to diss you or anything like this because I, pr- I appreciate reaching out. However, you know, the, the reason for Israel's current policies is for their own security is bullshit. And you know it. Like, they're not giving Palestinian people in the West Bank building permits and getting them and removing them through technicalities is nothing, has nothing to do with security at all it has to do with making your racial demographic you it's about selecting a preferred racial demographic and then enforcing policies right as to achieve that goal as is new settlement creation you know you don't create a brand new settlement in in an occupied territory because you're afraid of yeah more of more terrorism think like think how (laughs) ridiculous that sounds so you're creating a settlement Inside the dangerous area? Inside a dangerous area for security? What? There's a wall for security. The wall, by the way, annexes territory. It goes in like a couple of miles uh, over the line. Many miles. It was supposed to be. But, I mean, even though the wall annexes territory, um, like like how how do settlements help with security? That sounds unbelievably ridiculous and and like just not well thought through and um the intent from israeli politicians that you hear is it says we need to we're the reason why that human rights report came out um the one that we were discussing the other day where it said israel is an apartheid state um and bet salem also came out and said israel is an apartheid state they uh human rights watch said that Israel's is committing crimes against humanity. The reason why they were able to put that report out, or, you know, because everyone, they've been doing this for a long time, so people are like, why now? What's the political angle about putting this human rights report out? Right. Oh, we're, everyone's ganging up on Israel for no reason. Eh? Mm-hmm. So lefties. Eh? Um, the reason why they're, they're able to put it out is because Israeli politicians such as Benjamin Netanyahu, who are trying to cater to Israel's very, very extremist right, are talking about how they are, they, they are talking about, uh, they're, they're providing open intent of maintaining a Jewish demographic. Right. And they're not quiet about it. They're, right? they're, they're that. very clear about they're it. They're not quiet about it. They're very, very loud about it their condition like you can just look up like what they're saying in open about maintaining um a jewish, jewish domination right. in that region for in, and so, for demographic reasons and you know for other for purely reasons, for, for purely demographic mm-hmm. reasons so it has nothing to do with security it has everything to do with um making a preferred outcome of uh, ethnic or or uh, demographic outcome and you know a state you can have the argument like does a state have the right to uh, manufacture its own, uh, you know, its preferred ethnic outcome? But it can do a state can do that, but not at the expense of somebody else at another group. Like, mm-hmm. if you all want to buy private property and make a state that allows one ethnic group or whatever, if, if it's nonviolent, then that's fine. Like, you know, you're not hurting well, anyone. I mean, I but suppose that is the are, argument for the settlers right now that they're buying private property and they're doing that nonviolently and therefore and and the response that they get out of it is violence right that is the argument on that side and let's let's give that some airtime for a moment and it's true when you say it that way but you know again we're talking we're not talking about 
when when we when we when we start digging into some of the legality of it and when we start really in, inspecting it we're not always finding a cut and dry like this was empty land and private property that was duly purchased you know like in many of these situations there there's some sketchy backstory to how we you know how that land was acquired and i don't i don't need to rehash the entire two and a half our episode that we did last time around where we talked about you know like we started in ottoman land you know ownership laws you know but you know truly sometimes you have to go that that far back to realize that you know these folks that were already living there for hundreds of years thousands really got a raw deal and they're going to be upset about it regardless if you think or if if we claim that it's legal or not it's just raw deal in general and continuing to do so is provocative Regardless if you th- if you have a, a quote unquote legal and uh, 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 you know backing or not, it's just definitely very provocative. So the the thing that you said earlier was like, what do you expect to happen? What do you expect the al- like like what do you expect the outcome is going to be? The people are just going to like peacefully roll treating, over and die. You're treating another group like shit. Yeah, it's like at least people want to die with dignity if they're going to die if they're going to die. Um, but um. Another thing, you know, with, with like state security, yeah, I believe a, a country, a state, has the right to defend itself. Um, yeah. not, def, not, I wasn't going to say defend itself, um, just because it's just such a talking point that I'm so tired of hearing. <laughs> um, I was going to say a state has the right to allow certain people and not allow people in uh, based off their security risks. Well, what the Israelis are doing is they're not looking at individual people. They're just uh, looking, they're just throwing a really wide net on Palestinians and denying their right of movement based off security reasons. Just by virtue of who they are. But by virtue of who they are. It's not like looking at this person who may have a violent history or, you know, they have intelligence. They just blanketly don't, not letting people move through borders. So none of their like most of their uh what they're doing has nothing to do with their security and i want to end this show by pulling up this quote from a israeli politician named bizalel smotrich jeez He's the leader of Israel's Religious Zionist Party. And this is a quote from 2015. October 2015, yeah. So um, here's what it says. The PA is a liability and Hamas is an asset. The Palestinian Authority. Sorry, just want to make that clear. On the international playing field, in this game of of the d You try reading. (laughs) I'll do it. I'll do it. it Let's start it over. All right. So the PA, the Palestinian Authority, is a liability and Hamas is an asset. On the international playing field, in this game of the delegitimization, think about for a second, the Palestinian Authority is a liability and Hamas is an asset. It's a terrorist organization. Nobody will recognize it. Nobody will give it status at the ICC. And nobody will let them push resolutions at the UN, and they'll need an American veto, or we won't need one. And then he goes on to say, I'm not sure that all that given, excuse me, let me start that over. He goes on to say, I'm not sure at all that given the current situation, given the current facts that that the central playing field we're playing in is international, they're Abu Mazen or Abbas is costing us serious casualties and Hamas in such a situation would be an asset. I don't think we need to be afraid of that, afraid of Hamas taking over. So here's a guy in October 2015 who is the leader of Israel, uh, Israel's religious Zionist party who is clearly making the case that Hamas is better for Israel than the Palestinian Authority by virtue of it being a terrorist organization. I, I just you should let just game, let that yeah, just let that sink in. That's the language that's crazy. On the international playing field, in this game of 
the delegitimization. Delegitimization. I can't pronounce. <laughs> de- le- I can't say that word. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Delegitimization. Delegitimization. <laughs> delegitimization. It's, it's after 12 p.m. on Thursday, so that's usually when my slurs, my my slurring of words comes out. <laughs> um, but I will conquer that word one day. I conquered uh, mis. Misogyny. Mis- <laughs> Clearly, you haven't conquered it. Misogyny. misogyny. I've, I'm back. Misogyn- misogynistic. Yes, I have. Mm-hmm. Some words I can't really pronounce very well. <laughs> um, my, my cross to bear. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I think that Hamas is, is used. Um, it's, it's the Frankenstein. It's Israel's Frankenstein. It's the boogeyman. Uh, it's um, a creature that was created I, for the benefit. I, I just kind of want of. Uh, it served. It served. It served two purposes. The Hamas serves two purposes, or it had served. Now it, it began as serving one purpose, the purpose of, um, you know, obviously what we went over pretty thoroughly is that to be a bold to counter the PLO and secular nationalism. But now it just serves a purpose of. Of um, delegitimizing, just, de- just yes, <laughs> the the Palestinian Authority. And, so, yeah, I I think I think that's that that part is nuts to me because you know in the top of this episode we are making the claim the very very serious claim that Hamas is a is a bad organization that Hamas is a terrible institution that has caused a lot of human suffering in this region both definitely Israeli but also. Uh, as a result, Palestinians as well. We agree. We think they're fucked up. But when when you start looking at where they came from, what's if we all can agree that they're a fucked up institution, it it makes it really troubling that you know uh, th- that their origins were not only allowed to thrive but were encouraged in many ways by the Israeli government. And by and by, lots of organizations all over the world. So we, we we created this monster, and now that we recognize it as such as a monster, you would think that the you know that that the entire apparatus would be you know uh, working against it. But you know, quite the contrary. This guy, who's just one of many voices in you know in in Israel's you know religious Zionist party. Are, are basically saying that this is a useful tool because with you know if we could if we can make this connection that Palestinians are Hamas and Hamas are Palestinians and Hamas is the bad guy and they're terrible and they kill people then you can you can never legitimize and if you say Hamas speaks for Palestinians like you can never legitimize a Palestinian claim for for statehood or for anything for that matter at what expense do 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 people like Bezalel Smortrich propagate the idea that it's okay to have in Hamas and is the expense is human lives is israeli and palestinian alike yeah and i just think it's a uh part of the legacy just the the old legacy of uh which has been going on for a long time as uh of uh of western country uh financing and fostering um extremist in the arab and in, in, in muslim world in order for some geopolitical reason right um it's interesting that you know pretty much it's just such a long long history of funding what um either terror groups or um the origin or like you know the seeds of terror groups uh fun history we actually talk a lot about that in our podcast um right. probably a bunch of them we cover this topic so i can't remember the certain episodes i don't know what's a good episode on that that we've done i mean we've done on the muhajideen that's that's probably a good one um that's oh we did some episodes on the origins of al-qaeda mm-hmm. um yeah Listen lead to up to nine eleven would be another great lead up of nine eleven uh, series. Um, that was last year around oh, September. Anything that we do on Syria, we'll probably go over that pretty thoroughly right. as well. 
Uh, I guess, but right, as I'm... a proxy, also Yemen. Uh, a lot of our Yemeni coverage has has you know elements of this sprinkled in as well. Yes, um, I guess we're back to our roots, talking about the Middle East again. Yep. Um, all right, we are. I'm checking out. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of Bro History. Um, we really do appreciate it. You know, you guys uh, continuing to listen to us um, and uh, bearing through us on these hot late spring nights that are about 100 degrees where we get delusional and kind of hazy by the end of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we appreciate that. If you like the show, rate and review the podcast. That is the number one way to help us grow this show is rating and reviewing the show. Give us a five stars. That's the best thing that you could do. It really helps us. Um, and you can also join our Patreon if you're interested. There's some extra content in there and you get to our Slack account. We have a good community going on where we um, are constantly talking about these things. Uh, Danny. Danny. You want to lead us out, buddy? <laughs> nah, I'm good. <laughs> I'll leave you All like right, Danny. <laughs> I guess I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> see ya. All right, see you guys. Peace. <laughs>